just ain't no good for jealous I try it night after night You're in someone else's arms in Dallas Does Fort Worth ever cross your mind? British invasion had a tremendous effect on our whole country. They really rocked and it made me want to, to do that. We were watching Ed Sullivan and the Beatles came on and my girlfriend, next door neighbor, and I were watching and I said, that's what I want to do. That's it. That's, I didn't want to do anything else. That was like your basic turning point. When we saw that, we said, yeah, that's what we want to do. They played real good live, even over all the screams of the girls. It was like girls, too, man. Lots of screaming girls. One of my favorite things. Girls were screaming. And that kind of appealed to me. Next day, everybody had their hair combed down <laughs> and trying to find Beetle Boots, and everybody had a guitar. The reasons why I'll go. Oh, I saw a man. To ch changed my life. I tell you, I woke up with a neck with, with long hair the next morning. I sat there, uh, uh, grunted and grunted, and next morning I had long hair. And we were all on the phone to each other, going, "Did you just hear what I heard?" And from then on, everybody started growing their hair and dressing alike and trying to play English music. And so we changed the way we looked, we changed the kind of instruments we wanted, we changed the way we dressed. Everybody started getting navy jackets. <laughs> even a couple of them <laughs> affected an English accent. They didn't even know they were doing it. They just, they just liked the English scene so much. They, they, they had this kind of talk, you know? Then we had a lot of music to learn, a lot of chords to learn, because the, the English chord structure is a little different than the American chord structure. I went to a place to get a chicken fried steak and all they had was fish and chips. <laughs> you know, it's like, where's my chicken fried steak? And that's when that whole Tina Gogo scene started. The reasons why I'll go. Elvis came on the scene, all the young guys would go out and buy guitars and try to be an Elvis. When the Beatles came on the scene, we saw guys grouping together to form their own little bands in the garage. That's the term garage bands because the parents wouldn't let them practice in the house, too much noise, you know. Over the fence, I heard a guitar. <laughs> and then what would we be, like 14 or 15? Yeah. I climbed over the fence and met Eddie and he was, had, a, had this great guitar and I was just fascinated, and I think, and then we goofed around and played in the garage for a yeah, while, yes, and then we yes, met Bruce. Literally in the garage. Yeah. Uh, we would rehearse in our guitar player's family's basement and uh, which was the basement connected to their garage. So, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know who coined the, the term garage bands or garage recording, uh, but this was definitely a garage band. I didn't realize for the longest time that 
that playing could actually be done. It was on TV. Every time I saw music, I either heard it on the radio or I saw it on TV. I went to a, an assembly in what's now called middle school, and there was a fellow playing guitar, a guy named Ronnie Wise, who eventually became Mouse. Uh, it was him and a drummer, and I remember it was like it was yesterday. They did Money, Honey, and I'm Walking, and the girls went crazy. You know, I thought, that's for me. I don't know exactly why I wanted to be a musician. Because it was cool. Since we weren't athletes, at least I wasn't, there was no way to be cool uh, for the girls unless you did something different. And one of the different things to do was to be a musician. I think what made me want to be a musician is... Uh... Women. The chicks. Girls, and I didn't want to play football. Girls. Uh, not me. I wanted to reach deep intellectual plateaus. Lots of girls. Lots of girls. Yeah. I mean, you did that. He just wanted chicks. Betty Lou got a new tattoo. Betty Lou got a new tattoo. Betty Lou got a new tattoo. In the 1960s, all across America, there were teen scenes. And it was really a heady period because it was kind of the, the dawn of the uh, youth, youth culture as it was, the first time that uh, teenagers really had uh, uh, music and, and places to go and could identify with it uh, around the clock. We played 24 dances in 21 days and we, we just we put ourselves on tour. See, we traveled around. We'd, we'd play as far away as Memphis. By the time we were in 11th and 12th grade, we'd be playing either locally or out of town every weekend. And we were making more money than my father could believe because we had records out. We, we were playing these big society parties or playing you know, pretty good club gigs. And I was making a lot more than I could have made Working, the, you know, working on a milk truck or something. A lot of bands played it. I don't know if they still do that now. Or National Guard armories. I mean, God, did we play a lot of National Guard armories from here, Fort Worth, Cleburne, Weatherford. We would rent the armory. It would cost us, uh, I think it was uh, $35 and a case of beer, if I remember correctly, to rent the local armory. They're back! The fabulous Soul Man, the Vipers, the Harlequin Vipers are back this Thursday at the Opry House on Highway 62. Starting time, 8 o'clock to who knows when. Fun, fun, fun! We'd rent National Guard armories or municipal auditoriums for $25, $30 a night, pay a policeman $10 or $15 to watch the door, and hire one of our college buddies to take the tickets at the door and have two or 300 kids come in at $1.50 a head. We rented the Hearst Civic Center on Friday nights, and Larry's parents and grandparents came down there to chaperone. There was no alcohol. We hired security, and they would watch the door. And if you came in there and you had any kind of smell of alcohol, you didn't get in. And they, police would walk you out. But we would bring in at least, I would say at least 500 there a night. I think most of the venues that we played in most of the other cities were pretty much the same as they were in the Dallas area. We had, uh, we had a pretty good following when we were in the XLs. We had, a, because of our record in the Texas, Oklahoma area, we had a, a decent following there. Uh, and then Louisiana. in Louisiana, yeah. But but for the most part, everywhere we went, I mean, it was the same everywhere. The kids were good. We went from Oregon to Boston in three days. That wasn't easy to do. And in, in a car, we drove night and day. We were a little bit late, so what we had to do, we played at, in the downtown lounge, which was on the Boston Common, and it was, which I didn't know, was the combat zone. And we were still very young. We walk into this club and we got dressed and we started playing. Oh, baby. 
Baby, it's hard to tell What makes the sun to shine That night, yeah, we actually uh, were walking out and the manager, the police were coming in and the manager had been shot while we were playing. Just shot. And uh, the next week, we played two weeks, the next week we were tearing down to go home and he got shot, another one got shot. So we said, you know, this is just not good for us. We gotta go home, go to school, you know, and, and start playing back in Fort Worth again. I don't believe there was a, a situation like this everywhere, you know, in the country. Certain there, was, there were other places, but uh, we had a very special scene going on here. I find the music of the Dallas-Fort Worth area pretty interesting geographically. The one thing with Fort Worth that gets me is Fort Worth's for garage bands has an incredibly high batting average. There's very few bad Fort Worth 60s records, and it just, it's remarkably high. I mean, we went through the whole stack of them, and there was only a few cast-offs. I don't, I can't compare that with any, any place else, like the, the Northwest, where you had groups like the Sonics and stuff, where really a lot of the best stuff is from. It also is a home to a lot of the worst stuff, you know? I just say like Fort Worth, I, I, I'm not quite sure why because even Dallas is different than Fort Worth record wise. It's a great creative area, one that's slightly exotic to me as a New Yorker. You know, my closest to the garage teen scene would have been in New Jersey, which is very suburban. Uh, but Texas is almost like, uh, you know, alien territory. What was going on in Fort Worth was certainly connected to what was going on throughout the southern United States, which is where rock and roll was invented. And you certainly had a scene that was reflective of what was going on in Texas, uh, which was unique and separate from the South. I mean, you had all kinds of different sounds. And then you had this city that was big enough to have its own scene, but still far enough away uh, to be unique. The thing that made Fort Worth different was the way that they would bring their own personalities to it, what, whatever it meant to be from Fort Worth and grow up in Fort Worth. Fort Worth is not one of the top 10 major cities in America, so people think Fort Worth teen scene, that's, that's a little odd, you know, like, no it's not, listen, it's really, really good records and they'll always sound good. I think there's always been a music tradition in Fort Worth. I know that, you know, going back to uh, pre-World War II, you know, there's there's been uh, clubs all over Fort Worth. Fort Worth used to be a pretty wide open town that had a lot of clubs, had a lot of live music. Uh, I mean, Jacksboro Highway, East Lancaster, and all those places used to be just lined with clubs. And of course, the idea was that you could go in there and uh, hear live music. Baby. Basically, I was playing in bars when I was 13, 14 years old, and then um, it, when I got involved with these guys, it was playing in teen clubs, and it was kind of like a step up. 14 years old, playing a club in Dallas. Uh, went down there, didn't know a thing about it. They hired us to play in the afternoons, 20 bucks. We got a did our little thing, played, we were all young. I think our drummer was like 12 at the time. Bobby Talkington. Yeah. Oh uh, played our deal, went down, sat in the audience, here come the strippers out on the stage. So we were playing for strippers in between <laughs> sets. Ray Beard and Dennis Beard put together a club called Tina Gogo -Go and provided a place for us to play. Up until that time, it was uh, uh, bars and things like that and they were they were primarily for adults, they served alcohol, and uh, there really wasn't any place for teenagers to go. And so it really was breaking ground, and it was something new. No one had done that before, and uh, well, And some and of the, they, people, the people that started some of the clubs, they made some pretty good cash. I know that the, uh -huh. the Beard Brothers at any given time had two or three of these places going, and uh, they were packing them in and raking in some dough. <laughs>
Tina Gogo was, was the top go-go place in Fort Worth during the 60s. Uh, other ones came up, Action a go-go, uh, Holiday a go-go, but it's, it was all just, it was teenagers just out dancing to live music and, and having fun and going out to hear their favorite bands. And each Friday or whatever nights that these happened, the, the places were packed, usually a buck ahead. Every Friday night, we went to the Tina Gogo, the whole family went. It was a social event, you know, it was a social club. Everybody they, dressed up to go out. Being 10, I went in my shorts and my tennis shoes, but I danced all night long. I never sat down. I was dancing with, you know, all the college and the high school boys, but it was cool because my parents were right there watching. You played Tina Gogo, Accent of Gogo, and Jolly Time Roller Rink. They were all owned by two guys named the Beer Brothers. You ask me why. We played the Holiday Hop and we played uh, Candy Stick A Go Go. Those were our hangouts. But we'd always go, every chance we got, we went to Tina Go Go. That was our favorite, favorite hangout because it was where the Jades played, where the Blue Notes played, where Little Joe and the Gentlemen played. And we loved those guys. They were so good and they looked so good. You know, they all dressed up in their little suits. Sometimes we'd play at a hamburger joint or, you know, something like that, just set up wherever. All the little teen clubs around Fort Worth uh, played most of those with the, the Sonics and Jack and the Rippers. So. We did a lot of the Battle of the Bands. Uh, didn't win any of them, of course. Uh, the elite were always the main people who win those. And as a fan, not being a musician and just looking for, you know, what, as to what you were going to do over the weekend, you were tired of going to drive-ins. We found places that they were playing. We wanted to go see, and there there was so much talent. Tina Go Go was where I went because it's kind of my neighborhood. I mean, it was great. Just um, be able to see these kids, just a little bit older than me, up there, just wailing away on the music I, I really was into. It's changed somewhat, but it's initially the same. They would partition it off and the stages, if I recall, were back against the wall back there. There were newspaper articles about it. Uh, they, want, they noticed that there was, uh, on Friday nights, it, because of Tina Gogo, there was a drop in juvenile delinquency in the area. I remember when it first started, Roundup Inn can be partitioned. Right. You know, they got all these partitions in there, and they had this one little area partitioned, and it, it, there were uh, 150, couple hundred kids would show up, mm -hmm. and every week they'd have to open up more partitions until right. they had that, nearly that entire thing completely open because... We started out on the floor, and then all yeah. of a sudden they started building yeah. the ramps yeah. and the stage and everything. There was, uh, some nights it'd be 1,500 kids there. The teen club crowds were great. We'd get on the stage and we'd play some tunes and they would just go nuts. We'd all seen what was happening with the Beatles and these English bands and there was always screaming girls and everywhere they went. And you know, we'd sit there and watch that. Well, when we played at Tina Gogo, it happened to us. If you were booked at a go-go, you were, you were a star. Here we were up on stage with go-go girl on the right, a go-go girl on the left, and and a, a bunch of screaming girls down front. It's pretty heady stuff for teenagers. The go-go girls danced at Tina Go-Go and also Action A Go-Go. Yeah. And there were always go-go girls on mm. the go-go show. If you could score a date with a go-go girl, even that they had their own little entity. Dodie Dodge Dancers, another whole group <laughs> Forgot about of, of girls that got started doing Ruby. something. As, as part of the music scene in, in uh, Fort Worth. The Dodi Dodge Dancer group actually uh, got the first contract on Tina Gogo, -Go, and they were an excellent group of Gogo uh, -Go dancers. And we would come in as guest dancers. Um, and really, I think Team was probably the biggest one. Uh, working at KFJZ, though, was my 
personal preference because we did um, home show, lots of personal appearances. We actually went on many tours with uh, KFJZ and uh, worked at the, the huge um, concerts that would be uh, at Will Rogers Auditorium and Will Rogers uh, Coliseum. And so really KFJZ dancers at, did more at larger venues, uh, but we would all pretty much change around from venue to venue. And sometimes the bands would meet them or the Dr. Pepper Girl or somebody like that, so it was kind of cool because they were, all the guys were after the Go-Go Girls. Our fans were pretty equally divided between girls and boys. You know, the boys wanted to have photographs taken with us, uh, wanted to date us, uh, slipping phone numbers was a very common occurrence. Usually the Go-Go Girls had had big boyfriends, yeah. Yeah. Bob Zilla, guys yeah. like that. <laughs> you didn't mess with them. You had to have the look as well. The look was very much a part of it. You had to have that Go-Go dancer look. You had to be friendly. You had to be comfortable in front of an audience. You had to be able to move in such a way that an audience would want to, to watch you. I loved to watch the Go-Go Girls. I always wanted to be one of them. The girls were crazy. They were, I mean, that was the beginning of the, the whole revolution at that point. Uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were a lot of fun and I love every one of them. They, they, they taught me everything I know about living life and love. <laughs> there were still girls that would throw flowers up on stage and things like that. They never threw anything real amorous, but they'd send notes up there going, what are you doing after the show? And it's things like that and so and then they would try and meet us after the show and talk to us and it was kind of cool to be a teenager and have girls that were actually interested in you. We had girls lined up from here to way over there and out the door to, to sign our, our 45 and we're like 16 years old you know we all had beetle haircuts and we had cur curly kinky hair we had to go to this the uh, beautician place and get our hair straightened and cut funny and of course the lead singer he had perfect hair you know. One of the fans, uh, a female fan, uh, hired us to play a party and it was going to be at a hotel, mo motel there on South Freeway, uh, I-35 South there in Fort Worth and so we get all our equipment over there in the room that she had rented and uh, we get set up and we're ready to start playing we wonder where all the people are. <laughs> And it come to find out, she was the only person. She hired us to <laughs> a command for we her band <laughs> to play for her. We had fan clubs in Burleson, Alvarado, and all the little outlying towns, um, so we could. You know, anytime we were playing, we could, we could count on them to come. We had a fan club, and uh, it was uh, five girls, and each girl was for a musician. So, like, one was assigned to me, one was assigned to Larry, one was assigned to Randy, one was assigned They're to our and drummer at the time. Yeah. If you joined the fan club, you got a packet that had pictures and, and cards and all of that stuff, but we sent out a, a newsletter every month, and it was called the Elite Beat. That was just something that we thought that we needed to do is uh, to provide that for our fans. Uh, I'm from Fort Worth and I'm a, I'm a fan of garage music and I didn't know that there were so many bands uh, from Fort Worth, especially teen bands, uh, so I was amazed. We all know like the more familiar bands, you know, like the 34 Elevators or the Moving Sidewalks. And generally speaking, they were kind of like uh, older bands playing in the clubs, kind of playing more for like a club uh, audience. So I didn't know there was this, this huge scene of uh, teenage bands playing for teenagers and, uh, and uh, putting out records. I just had no idea that they even existed. The scene was just huge. I mean, there'd be hundreds of people and there were big rivalries. Um, you know, I was like 14, 15, and even I was aware of, uh, you know, the rival rivalries between the the bands, the Barons, the Jades, and the Elite. When we went over to uh, the Holiday Hop and played over there, it, it ruffled some feathers because we went over there and became immensely popular in somebody else's turf. The East Side had their bands, the West Side had their bands, 
we were like somewhere in the middle, but, and each of us, we, we strove to be the best that we could, and if we were in a battle of the bands, oh yeah, gloves are off. We'd do anything we could to win. Even when the battle of the bands were going and there were, you know, competition all the time, we didn't care who won. We just wanted to play and see our friends, you know, all our musician friends. Because if you're playing in different bands, you don't see them as much. How did they vote, though? Was it uh, I think applause we had or boxes? I think we had pretty girls with boxes, and they would put yeah. tickets or something the in the ballots or something. And everybody would bring out. They'd make sure that if it's a battle of the bands, you brought out as many of your fans as possible. And the lead always had the advantage because they always had the biggest fan clubs, and so we we'd call all of our friends, and they would come out there, and we'd put. Get, Go ahead and vote. Go ahead and vote, and then they'd announce it. And uh, it, our biggest competitors were the elite and probably Curly Benton and the Barons. They, they were, they were good in Battle of the Bands yeah. too. We'd play sometimes three Battle of the Bands in one night. We'd play first, and then we'd go play our job where we was going to be playing that night. And there was a few of them we won. We wasn't even there. I crawled out the window with my guitar and went to this thing and the guys picked me up and we went yeah, we went and, we went and played we went. the gig and about 10 minutes after I played the gig and came off the stage I looked out and here comes my dad <laughs> down and, and the kids were spreading out man they were making everybody backing off for me and the man man he grabbed me by my hair and he drugged me out of there cussing and, and uh, took me back home and locked me in my room and locked the window, made sure I couldn't open it again. And about midnight, two o'clock that morning, Ronnie and uh, the other guys come knocking on my window and uh, knocked on my window and I forced it open and they gave me my $50 because we had won the, the Battle of the Bands. Won that Battle of the Bands. Yeah. Did we ever win a battle of the band? Never. No, never. I don't did. think we ever won one. Never but we, it didn't stop us from playing. Never you know? could figure out how that voting went. No, either. we never could either. I don't remember what the prizes were. Was there any Not prize? Much, uh, had to be something. $50 or something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> divided by five. In the early 60s, uh, a group of four would get 50 bucks. A big payday would be a $100 gig. Which was a lot of money back then, boy, you know, like almost 20 today, I guess. I tried to make money and, you know, you, you wind up trying to help people and, and all of a sudden you're spending more money than you're making. I mean, we played some nights, man. We got, we got two bucks. We thought that was killer. <laughs> Made two bucks tonight. <laughs> I remember making 75 cents one night. <laughs> I would say during the period of time that the Elite existed, it had to be the Blue Notes, the Elite, the Jades, and Johnny Nitzinger and the Barons. The Barons were a power to be reckoned with. Well, we rode around on a flatbed trailer all day long playing Batman. Yeah. Oh. And then we did it again and again and again and again. While Bill McDavid, no, I mean uh, David. David McDavid ro rode around on a go kart in a Batman suit. We got paid well for it, though. They opened up with the Doors. Vanilla Fudge. The Beach Boys. Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Who else did we open up for? The Yardbirds. They Practically. came through Fort Worth and played at the auditorium. We usually opened up for them. We were actually scheduled to open for the, for the Rolling Stones. And um, at, at, at the last minute, they canceled us. We got a call from Mickey. And Mickey said, hey, you know, there are two British groups that are coming in to Will Rogers Memorial Auditorium, and they need instruments, not instruments, but uh, equipment, you know, like amps and PA and stuff. And we just happened to have the best around. So we said, oh, well, sure, we'll let them use it. And in turn, we can go see the show. We thought, well, that'll be nice to see a, a new group. So we, we walked in, they, we put this, the equipment up, set it up, did everything, and then we walked out. We walked back in, and uh, there must have been about, I would say, 100 people, not many people at all at this concert, and out walked the Stones. And they played on our equipment, and the Yardbirds with Jeff Beck. And I'm going, boy, they're pretty good. I kind of like them. <laughs> 
it was in the Coliseum there, yeah. and, it, and it was they had the rodeo going on, and it was a dirt floor. Yeah. There was a right. circular stage out in the right. middle of the rodeo arena, and they had the, they brought them in in the back of a uh, armored, armored car, armored car, because yeah. they thought they were going to be mobbed. But but their backstage deal was one of the cattle pens in the cattle right. barn. And remember, they were, they were sitting around in chairs like these here yeah. in the back in in yeah. the cattle barn, and they were starving, yeah. and somebody <laughs> brought them in those. Hot dogs. Those cold hot dogs. Yeah, they, they weren't very happy. No, the but they were nice guys. Fort Worth in many ways as a media market was joined at the hip with Dallas. So uh, first time the Beatles came to the United States, they played Dallas. Loads of British bands were coming through Fort Worth as well. Early on, the Rolling Stones, first real big tour, they came to Fort Worth. I remember the first English band I saw was Herman's Hermits. And we paid for box seats, which were all of $1.50 at Will Rogers Coliseum. So you had uh, a lot of uh, national acts, international acts coming through. But you also had this, Fort Worth was still isolated and separate from Dallas, so uh, the radio was different. We could tune in Cliff in Dallas or K-Box or pick up WRR and Cat's Caravan, but generally it was KFJZ and KXOL and uh, KNOK, the Rhythm and Blues station. You could pick all these things up. So you got the big picture of what was going on nationally, but you also had this great little vital local scene that didn't really travel much out of Fort Worth. <laughs> There was like a connection. If you're like 15, you went, oh, these guys have a band and they play this stuff and then they, they're also making records. So they're like, they're just as cool as the Rolling Stones because they're on the radio. We didn't know any difference. It's like, well, they're just as good as anybody. Well, it's a great feeling to um, record something then later hear it on the radio. It usually does sound a bit different. It goes through mastering procedure, goes on the vinyl, you know, at that time and then it gets compressed at the radio station, then you hear the DJ talk about it, talk over the intro and over the outro, and it's in a stream of consciousness of what the latest hit music is. And the listener doesn't know, is this a big record, is this new or what? It's just on the radio and that's what counts. We were in the car when they played it. And they go, and Mark Stevens goes, now here's a local band, the Candy Canes. And we went, ah! We were screaming like we'd seen the Beatles, and we turned it on full blast. I'm, I'm sure people thought we were crazy, you know? But we had this car that said the Candy Canes written on it. I'm sure they thought we were crazy anyway. Just driving along, listening to the radio, and Mark Stevens comes on, he says, this Friday or Saturday night or whenever it was, says, you don't want to miss this. The Fab Four from Fort Worth, who they, the band that looks like they just got off the boat from Liverpool. That's right. And those were the words that he said, and I thought, God, it gives me goosebumps now. <laughs> First time you heard your record over the radio, you just wished, my yeah. God, can somebody else hear this? Yeah. You'd roll the windows down, crank it up full blast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody hearing this? One DJ out of uh, New Orleans play, our, play a song. We did a cover of a, a Donovan tune called Season of the Witch. And we were told it was going to get played on the air out of New Orleans. Well, we were all excited. Guy got about eight measures into it and just drug the needle across the record <laughs> and said, sorry, boys, and you heard a snap. <laughs> we went, Talk oh, break. man. Breaking a young man's heart, I yeah, tell you. <laughs> but it ended up the number one played record at the Shakey's Pizza Parlor on airport freeway in Baton Rouge. <laughs> to get on the charts uh, was a biggie to begin with. I think it was the top 60, KFJZ and KXOL were the biggies. And you're on there with the Rascals, the Stones, the, you know, if, if you were a local band and you even, you even crept into the top 20, it was amazing. Sparky baby. Mark Stevens had a lot to do with getting our songs on there, mainly because we worked with him a lot in different uh, teen scenes, and yeah. I think he just liked us, and 
and played it because of that. He would tell us and give us advice on everything from what songs to play to what clothes to wear to how to wear your hair and we listened because yeah. he was he was the star and he was he was, he was like uh, not only a DJ but he was like a, a, a manager. Yeah, he was. And, and he, he could make you a break. Exactly. You want to help these, these guys uh, go where they want to go. And uh, there were some of the bands that really deserved it. And the guys that I, I liked, and, and they were easy to work with. First of all, you have to be talented to get me to be, you know, to be one of your uh, cheerleaders. And, and you got to be easy to work with. You can't be a head case. I, w I will not, I did not work with head cases. I worked with only talent that weren't head cases. That could that could take control of themselves and not get you know carried away because when you have you know hundreds of little girls screaming after you like you're the Beatles and you're not but you are in Fort Worth or wherever you know and and some guys would get you know like oh, well hmm. uh, I, I never worked with those kind of people I kind of you know. and there were some bands like the Elite and many others that were really really good uh, the Blue Notes fantastic. For some reason, we always knew when Mark was going to play our record. I don't know if it was Steve Mark or Major Bill. He's going to play it at 705. You guys listen. Well, not only would we be listening, we'd have our fan club ready to call in and vote. Oh, yeah. We'd have yeah. all of our all of our friends, and it was pretty much all over the school. They're going to be on there. And that not only would they do that, but after they played and they'd say how much they loved the song, whether it was terrible or not, then they'd call the record stores the next day. Oh, sure. For one solid week, every record store in town got calls from the fan club and from oh, all yeah. your friends going, do you have that record yet? Well, they just played it last night, and all it's going to be probably a couple of weeks. Well, and they call every day. He'd say, "Okay, the top nine at nine, I'm, and he'd play these songs, and then you'd you'd vote." Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you know, our record was won all the time because you know, 500 kids <laughs> would be redialing and calling back and redialing. Well, the elites won again. You know, I got to be kind of embarrassed in there for a while. They loved it. But it, but it, but the thing about the thing that was so, so heady about that, we wouldn't be competing against another local band. Oh, We'd no. be competing against national groups. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, they would they would bring these songs that they they wanted down and recorded at Bill Smith's recording studio. I guess if we had a local. Colonel Tom, Elvis's manager. It would be Major Bill. Oh, that'll tear a Piccadilly Circus apart, man. Bill was a lot of fun. He really was. And he took himself so seriously, made him even funnier than he was. He didn't realize how funny he was. He was known as, uh, uh, among some inner music business circles, as the London Flash in that he would come down and record somebody and if he couldn't get it on a American label real fast, he'd fly over to London and shop it to those people. Wouldn't Major Bill the guy that said if you throw enough mud at the wall long enough you're so, bound to cover it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that absolutely. was his notion of the recording business. His, philo his philosophy. Cover that thing and it's bound to come back for you. That's right. We're going to do the very end again. And we're gonna do some Oz on which one is that? Uh, don't, don't be, be cruel. Uh, uh, don't be cruel. We're yeah. going, we need some Oz. Major Bill paid for a certain amount of time, and you went in and got finished. And you know, he'd say, "Cut, it's a hit." <laughs> yeah. Smash. Good smash. Smash. That's smash. That's a cotton picking smash. Yeah. Yeah. Cotton picking smash. <laughs> That's a smash. He'd take it to the radio station and they'd play it. Philip, it's a cotton picking smash. It's a cotton picking smash. If my name isn't Major Bill Smith, it's a cotton picking smash. You can count on it. Take it to the bank. In fact, they named Smash Records after Bill Smith's little slogan there. Actually, cotton picker. That's why you always say, you know, it's cotton picking smash. We're over at Bruce House is rehearsing, rehearsing and uh, we weren't having any luck coming up with with the song uh, to record and we knew that Major Bill and Mark Stevens were coming over there that afternoon to see what we had. So we remembered this song. Uh, somebody brought up this uh, song about that the trash men did called the Surfing Bird. It, it was a surfing type song built around the phrase 
uh, Papa Oo Mau Mau. So we were saying, uh, well, let's, when they get over here, let's do something like the Surfing Birds song and, and let's use Mama Ooh Wow Wow. And so we ran through this thing a few times and then but we this went. this was really just a spook. We were like just a spook. Oh, exactly. Exactly. And uh, Major Bill showed up. He said, okay, what do you got? So we, we went into this uh, one potato, two potato, three potato, four, and they sat there looking at us, and we were trying to keep a straight face. And after we went through a few bars of this, Major Bill goes like this. It's a hit! It's a hit! <laughs> It's actually been covered by the six, five, six, seven, eights in, in a couple other bands. There was Billboard magazine and Record World, which were the two trade magazines that you went to to find. And and uh, I don't remember who gave us that copy, but they said, you got a four-star pick in Record World magazine with one potato. A one, a two. The Lake Worth Goat Man came about, and that was a fun story. Uh, the Lake Worth Goat Man was reported in several instances of this this monster that was coming out of the lake that lived on Goat Island. And he would swim the lake and he would come up and he would get you. So we wrote a song similar to that called, But Night of the Sadist. And uh, it was a night of the sadist, yeah, I remember that look in his eye. It was a night of the sadist, yeah, I remember the day I die. He attacks this couple on Lover's Lane. Well, we went in and recorded it. We made friends with Major Bill. That's a cotton picking smash. So we recorded it. I think it took us 20 minutes, which was a long time in Major Bill's studio to record anything. And then we did it, and the next day he called me and he said, Larry, we got a problem. Uh, FCC won't let us use the word sadist. And this is 1965. I said, Maze sadist is not that bad of a word. Uh, it's a little bit brave for the FCC. Uh, so let's, let's come up with something else. And then he, then he came up with the idea I told you earlier about Night of the Burglar. And I, I, I had a fit. No, it's not going to be called Night of the Burglar. That's so stupid. I said I was originally going to call it Night of the Goat Man, but that didn't have the right ring to it. So I came up with Night of the Phantom. Well, what we did, we didn't go in and re-record the whole thing like we should have. It's just a dreadful recording. You can hear it whenever you're, you're singing along, and then the words go down, and then Ray Hildebrand's there with us doing Night of the, instead of say it's a phantom. It was a night of the phantom, yeah, when I remember the day I died. We had 20th Century Fox picked up uh, Night of the Phantom, and then we had uh, Epic picked up Everybody Needs Somebody. Larry Harrison gave me a, a CD with about four or five different bands that had recorded. Most of them were the Phantom. One group did In and Out. Uh, it was Chesterfields, I think the Fuzz Tones, and the girl band Zuma did an actual version of Night of the, the Sadist, which was interesting. And it's really odd to hear bands covering your stuff. It's like, it's disconcerting, but it's a great, it's a great honor because we used to cover everybody's stuff. And a New York radio station still plays in and out in the Phantom. So it's, we're still getting airplay. It's, it's odd. <laughs> Getting on TV at that time for, for me, I, we, I thought it was the, the beginning of everything. Bobby Wygant's still, still around. She uh, asked us to play uh, during her show, and I think we were only probably one of two, maybe two bands that ever played on that show. Let's uh, listen to the elite as they play the first number. It's um, number one on the charts. It's a Rolling Stones number called Satisfaction. Uh, we were also invited to play uh, in Dallas 
at uh, a shell that uh, called something else, wasn't it something else? Ron Chapman. Ron, Ron Chapman. Chapman. Yep. These are the five Americans with Western Union. Would you join me in a welcome for our own five Americans? Here they are. Ah, something else was, uh, it was, it was amazing. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was like Dick Clark, but just, you know, much smaller thing. So I got to be sometimes a kid dancing out in the audience, which I thought that was kind of fun. Dick Clark was, of course, doing bandstand, but he was not on this market. For some reason, and it was Channel 8, ABC, for some reason, Channel 8 never carried Dick Clark. They did for a while, and then they stopped carrying him. I don't know why they didn't. But uh, the fact is that uh, we had the only game in town. A lot of local bands uh, played live uh, on, on the Stump Mouse show, like the five Americans who were on, uh, on the show. Now the thing that made the show different from any other teenage shows, yeah, we did the uh, write the record and dance, and th we had Go Go Girls, Go Go Girls, and they would lip sync custom jingles that were made for the show. It's something else. Any other shows had custom jingles at that particular time. Uh, these girls became very popular they became stars in, in themselves I mean they had fan clubs they had they had letters and it was just amazing they danced like crazy and so no matter what song we had they were able to dance almost as if choreographed although they weren't because they never knew what we were going to play I think one of the most exciting times in the show is when we had big name acts like Paul Revere and the Raiders Herman's Hermits Chad and Jeremy <laughs> It was a real treat to go in and be able to play uh, on the same bill or get to meet, you know, Paul Revere and the Raiders or Sonny and Cher or the Mothers of Invention or the Outsiders. Whoever was touring through would, you know, maybe stop off and do a, a song. So we got the exposure of being on TV. We got to see how TV worked. We got to see what they did when, we went, when they went to commercials. And we often play for the audience after the show was over with. It sort of turned into a regular concert. It created stars, their records would sell in record shops and uh, you know it was one of those high profile things for a thing for a, a young group to, to come onto the Something Else show. And all of them tried to tried to get on that show. Playing on the Something Else show was really a great exposure to the whole Dallas area and made sort of made you seem more valid. There were a couple of imitators, a couple of people that did other shows on other stations, but we were the 800 pound gorilla. I had a place at uh, Panther or Go-Go uh, out at behind the old Meadowbrook Bowling Alley, the yeah. Pro Bowl there, and that was every Saturday night deal. They televised it locally. They had uh, groups from uh, road groups and then local bands. We played on that several times. Mm -hmm. Dallas, you had bands like the Five Americans were having hits, and so some people were probably veering in that direction. There was 
way more hits coming out of Dallas than Fort Worth. I mean, and like these many years later, that just makes Fort Worth records all the more better. I think something that's made Fort Worth unique, not only in the music business, is uh, the fact that it is so unique a place and it's not a major market, even though we'd like to be. We're always the redhead stepchild of Dallas. So the things that we do are a little more innovative to our own uh, particular town than, say, a major market like Dallas trying to be like Chicago, trying to be like New York. Well, certainly we emulate those things, but again, it's, we have so much Western influence in, in our town that it's a little bit different. Fort Worth people were not accepted over in Dallas, and Dallas people weren't really accepted in Fort Worth. You know, it's just totally different things. You know, we approach it from a, okay, we know this song good enough, let's go play it. You know, and then Dallas is like, no, it's got to be right. You know, so. Well, I think the Fort Worth band sounded uh, more like the Kinks and, and uh, the Stones because we're more blues oriented, I think, over here in Fort yeah. Worth than, than they are in Dallas. Dallas is more of a cultural center and they're a little more into uh, a lighter taste of music, so, you know, so to speak. But, uh, they considered themselves more polished. Oh, right. yeah. It's that old Fort Worth Dallas. But we <laughs> used to wipe them out on all the, on all the battle of the bands. Fort Worth has a lot of soul to it. I mean, it's sort of like Denton uh, or like Austin. Um, Dallas tends to be a little plasticky uh, and kind of fancy and frou-frou, but Fort Worth really gets down and they're, 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 they know their country roots, they know their black roots, they, they appreciate rock and roll, and there's just kind of no BS about everybody. Everybody's there to enjoy themselves. Personally, I'd rather work with Fort Worth guitar players than Dallas guitar players because they're much better rhythm players. I think they're just, uh, a different, uh, they grew up with different kind of music. So. City rivalries were there, but it it was, you know, the disc jockeys, uh, they had Mark Stevens and, and Ron Chapman. You had the Bricks and the Preachers and the Five Americans, and, and then you had us and, and the other bands here in Fort Worth. So there was a, a pretty intense rivalry, but we were smart, see, because Mark Stevens would always get some Dallas bands to come over and be in our battle of the bands, and we always beat them but we'd never go to Dallas and do the same thing. <laughs> so I always enjoy playing Fort Worth a lot. And I still do, I still like going to Fort Worth because it feels like the way Dallas used to feel back in the 50s and 60s a little bit. I think in Texas, when you play music, you're supposed to be a pretty sharp guitar player. I think that's always been a thing. You know, Fort Worth, of course, they had a long blues tradition and uh, the rock and roll records like Ray Sharp. Um, you know, Dallas the same way. Teenagers that were five years older than me, they were all about going to the Skyliner Ballroom and uh, doing the North Texas push to uh, Jimmy Reed, uh, hearing Ike and Tina Turner and Ray Charles. You know, the, the Fort Worth was a major stop on the Chitlin circuit. And you couldn't help but have that rub off on you. I mean, on our top 40 charts, yeah, the Beatles came in and blew everybody out, but you also at the same time had uh, Jimmy Reed singing Big Boss Man and Farron Young singing Hello Walls, which was written by a guy who was hanging around Fort Worth named Willie Nelson. Well, we were doing a lot of uh, Freddie King, Albert King, uh, the Nightcaps, like Linda Lou. James Brown. Uh, Jimmy Reed. Yeah. That was uh, pre-British Invasion. That's what everybody was doing. As far as rock and roll goes, um, it was uh, the black rock and rollers that got my attention and, I, and almost everybody I knew that I hung out with. If you were any kind of band worth its salt, you played Linda Lou yeah. over and over and over. <laughs> we all knew that song. It was played on the radio long after it first came out. And Ray Sharp was about the coolest guy around. Ray Sharp was our Chuck Berry. He was a black man raised on rhythm and blues and he played rhythm and blues, but he knew how to play it for not only a black audience, but a white audience. He was Chuck Berry, except maybe even better. Ray Sharp probably molded my style more than anybody else. You listen to the rhythm and the beat of Linda Lou, and you're making the connection between Jimmy Reed and doing the Skyliner and the North Texas Push. 
and what came out at the end of the 60s. It's the key to the whole thing of why Fort Worth music was so uh, everlasting and so distinct. It's, it's, it's the R&B influence that, that all the artists had here. And we could go out on a given night to the Skyliner and on the mm -hmm. Jacksboro Highway where you would hear some of the best blues players in the world. <laughs> you would go to the White Sands Supper Club. You could go anywhere in Fort Worth that there was live music just about, and it was all good. We used to finish gigs and we'd go to Cellar and they knew who we were down there and they'd say, hey, come on up and set in and play. At that time, the Cellar were circulating people like, well, not only the local legends like Bugs Sanderson and those guys, but the Winters Brothers and you don't know who you might see down at the Cellar on any, any given night. And that's the place where the Secret Service guys were partying the night before they went over to Dallas with John Kennedy. So they may not have been as sharp as they should have been. The cellar was like university for rock and roll. There was a freedom there, you know, among other things, musically, that drew musicians in. It, uh, every time a uh, name act came into town, they went straight to the cellar after their show. I walked in there when I was 16, and I had found heaven. I, I, this is where I was supposed to be. Uh, all the waitresses had on panties and bras, and they had bands where you're on an hour and off an hour, on an hour and off an hour, and open to six to six. My kind of place. We had lights for everything. There was a light that came on if the owner came in. Pat Kirkwood was his name. Uh, this is true, because they had ro rules posted that he had made up so many seconds or minutes between songs, the way you had to act, this kind of stuff. It was just, it was such a joke because it didn't exist there at all. But there was a particular light that came on and we knew Kirkwood was coming in. So everybody hopped to it while he was in there. He'd be from there for 30 minutes or something, then he'd leave. There was a light that came on if the cops were coming in because the girls tended, not only the waitresses, but the customers, to get up and strip, completely strip, start naked. And so there was a light that would come on that would tell, tell them or us that the cops were coming in to stop that. There was a light that came on that meant there was a fight, keep playing. They had some bounces in there. Some the real ones. Part gorilla, <laughs> part, part hulk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you didn't want to give anybody any trouble there. I mean, I literally lived there. I would uh, sleep on the cushions after they closed, get up when the guy came in to clean up the place, and uh, if it had been three or four days in the same clothes, I'd walk down to Sanger Harris, which was right down the street, and I'd buy some more clothes and come back and, and then play all night again. I mean, I'd still be there if I hadn't got kicked out and they hadn't shut down. If you wanted a, a good dose of quality R&B, it was here in Fort Worth from the 50s on. And that's, yep. the Beatles even copied it. Oh, sure. Uh, and that's where the, a lot of the English stuff came from, was the, them trying to copy R&B. And it sounded like a white guy trying to sing R&B. The Beatles would not be the Beatles if not for texts. And for two reasons, really. One is their name uh, was a variation on the theme of the Crickets, a band that greatly influenced them. Buddy Holly and the Crickets coming out of Lubbock. The other reason is because of Fort Worth. The Beatles would not have had their R&B mojo if not for touring with Bruce Chanel when he's writing the biggest hit to ever come out of Fort Worth, Hey Baby. He's touring England and John Lennon's listening to Bruce Chanel's harmonica player who really provides the hook to Hey Baby and that's Delbert McClinton's harp playing. And basically Delbert teaches John Lennon, here's how you play this thing. And within a matter of months, Love Me Do shoots up the charts, and it's one of the Beatles' follow-up uh, number ones to I Want to Hold Your Hand, and the rest is history. Years ago in the 60s, I think the, the Fort Worth sound was much more influential than probably anyone ever even realized until more recently, where people draw that line where, oh yeah, hey baby, that was a huge song. 
was a huge hit all over the country and in, and in England especially, you know, and, and you know, the line has been drawn right back to, to John Lennon and Delbert McClinton. The music that came out of Fort Worth couldn't have happened anywhere else. And it was all these little nuances and influences that were just right. Fort Worth was not too big and it was not too small, but it was a place unto itself. And I think it's a, a testament to the music scene in Fort Worth that you can look all over the country and you can see people who came from Fort Worth and went on to become uh, musicians and, and producers and, and writers and, and technicians and all of these things all over the country uh, that came out of Fort Worth, Texas. And a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't believe that. But I've told a lot of folks, I said, you just don't know. You don't know what came out of Fort Worth. The interesting thing about Fort Worth teen music in the 1960s is nobody made it big. A few bands did over in Dallas, a few bands did down in Houston, San Antonio. Really, no one made it big uh, as a Fort Worth band. I think if we'd have had somebody that really knew what they were doing and handled us correctly, uh, I think that, you know, we, we would have been uh, national, gone, could have gone nationally. You had to be in New York or LA that's right to, to make it and if you're from that's anywhere right. else like if you're in Omaha Nebraska if you're in Fargo South Dakota yep. or Fort Worth Texas the odds are way against you so that's why a lot of a lot of groups and a lot of people went went to right. other markets to see if they could make it you can only go so far and at that point after a certain period in your career you had to move on because a lot of the Fort Worth people knew you, but nobody else could get to you. You weren't exposed enough. The players from this area, from Fort Worth especially, didn't look to Dallas to further their careers. They looked at New York or Los Angeles. The rock and roll scene, Dallas, Fort Worth, North Texas area, and the bands and singers, there were some, some big artists that came out of here and went elsewhere, but they had to go where there were record labels bona fide record labels that had offices and distribution and so forth. They had to leave to do that, unfortunately. Once the corporate lackeys started taking over in the late 60s and into the hippie period, um, there, that, the chance of going from the garage to the radio station disappeared. It was just like low gas prices. It was lost in time forever. By the end of the 60s, there was virtually no scene there. In fact, I'll use myself as an example that by 1972, I, w I worked an underground radio station in Arlington called uh, KFAD. And when they switched formats, it's like, why well, stick around here? This ain't where it's at. You know, it's, it's tough to keep a band together, especially if you're a teen band. You got a couple things going. You might make some noise. You might get a record out. You might get it played. And then what? Then, then you either kind of find your way into the music business with a major record label and get exploited and bitter and everything goes to hell. Or you get some kind of, you know, extraordinary lifestyle habit that somewhat encumbering. Music is a tough road. You know, you, a lot of things stop you from pursuing music, not the least of which is earning a living, maintaining a family, um, keeping up your creative spirit and reason for being, your relationship with your musical partners, um, the scene on your witch in its own that, that you're on in, your, in its own longevity, and the fact that many are called but few are chosen. Uh, one thing you have to know about a life in music is that there's many times when you have to keep the life going to keep the music going. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just can't. It doesn't mean that you have to withdraw from it. Once you get up on stage and once you perform, that never leaves you. And to this day, I, I, I get these, I'll be driving down the road and I'll say, 
gosh, I wish I could go play in front of a thousand people this weekend. Or I wish I could go play at La Zona Rosa this weekend or something. You never get over doing that and you take every opportunity that you have to do it. I tried to get out of it for, for, for a while and it didn't work. It, uh, it's something that's always there. People on a scene do it because they want to. They may think they're going to make some money or they think they're going to get to be a celebrity, but really what they're doing is being the one who the spotlight is on for that moment. You know, I thought it was just part of growing up and it happened everywhere, but then some years back, you start hearing about these people in England and parts of Europe and these weird little cults that are probably not unlike whoever's behind this scene and they, they start digging up these garage bands yeah or these whatever people we that were. were played back when we did and so it seems to be still alive you know how did they know about this stuff how did you know how did they even know about these things how did they know it existed I'd forgotten about it when we first started getting into garage band music there were back from the grave uh, compilations out and they had Fort Worth bands on them. The whole thing that kind of motivated us initially with the article for Kicks Magazine was kind of a cultural pride in Fort Worth. Yes, so, yeah, this, is, this is our hometown and this is what uh, the earlier generations before us were doing. We're thinking, you know, we got to find these groups and, you know, f do their story. Billy Miller and Miriam Lennon are huge rock and roll fanatics. They don't care what sells what. In fact, the more obscure, the better. And when they came upon some of these sides, first they were gonna do one volume, and then it's like, let's do two, and then let's do three. This is unprecedented. You know, there's, there's not a three volume set of Los Angeles rock and roll in the 60s. And what was made there was, was a marketing confection that was for the record companies. There was no scene like there was in Fort Worth. So really, and a lot of people knew about the Fort Worth music, six, the 60s music scene, you know, in other parts of the country besides here. Here, no one remembered it or knew of it. Yeah, it was kind of like we didn't realize what we had sitting. Yeah. We were sitting on top of something that uh, had never really been looked at. Why are people interested in stuff that teenage people played? People are interested in you know, the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or the Doors or these people. Why are people interested in this stuff that these teenagers put out? And I was just shocked that there was its interest. It was really weird to these guys, you know, why would you want to know about that period, you know? <laughs> yeah, they'd be going, why do you want to know about this band when I, when I was 18, when I was in a semi-professional band, you know, hippie band in the 70s, that yeah. was the one that was really cool. They didn't really get it. The bands from Fort Worth should be real proud of what they did. I, everyone I talked to in the bands seemed to be real proud. You know, the Elite, the um, Larry and the Blue Notes, all these guys. They made, they all made great records. And you know, sometimes people make a record and they're, oh, it failed, nothing happened. But I mean, these many years later, they just, they the records really, really stand up. And they don't, they're not, there's no big nostalgia factor connected with them because none of us really, outside of Fort Worth, really heard these things. A lot of the recordings were dreadful, but for some unknown reason, because of what the feel was, it, that's, that's overlooked. I think what makes Garage Records, you know, so great is the innocence that they they really just had no no idea they were little kids you know I mean you, you know it gets complicated when you're a 50 year old man playing garage rock you know because then you know exactly what you're doing you know and you're aping moves that you saw and you're doing stuff you learned you're 16 years old you know you come from from your phys ed class you go to you know Bob's dad's you know garage studio you know and and you, you look at a microphone for the first time and you're saying you know you know tonight at 10 I'm gonna do her again you know or whatever you think that lyric is you know and that's rock, you know. That's 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 a that, that's art, you know. That's being made completely unselfconsciously and almost unconsciously, which is even better, you know. I mean, give, give me bands that completely don't know what they're doing. It's not surprising that singles that were made in Fort Worth in the 1960s 
are now rare collectibles. And, and there's two reasons. One is the fact that none of these singles were huge successes the first time around, so there weren't a whole lot of copies printed. They're rare. The second is, now that we've gone beyond the viability of these singles as commercial successes, people are listening to them for the pure art of them. And they're discovering this stuff was really good and like nowhere else. My brother called me several months ago and he said, you should get on eBay. And because they're, they're selling our record, Let's Dance, and somebody from uh, outside of, was it Germany? Paid like $325 for the thing. And we remember uh, throwing them in the lake. We, we, you know, we did not get any royalties. The manager decided he wasn't going to, not the assistant manager, but the manager that's decided that's he was saying. So we went, uh, so we went into the Gibson store and. Basically broke into the, <laughs> I, I broke into their warehouse. And we took yeah. all the records yeah. out and said, well, they're not going to pay us for it, and we're taking them. And so. Uh, uh, they're at the bottom of Lake Levon. Yeah. One of the, the unexpected side effects of the internet is that, is that rarity is amplified. You know, if, if, if there's one copy of a single floating around, you know, there's thousands of people that can be looking for it on the internet. Whereas 25 years ago, you know, they were looking for it in the back of gold mine, you know, and that wasn't the same kind of an audience. So now, you know, you can put something on eBay and say, here, I've got this, this is why it's important, you know, maybe you want it. You know, I mean, there's, there's records I'd pay $100 for. We had a copy of, of My Confusion that sold for $275. And then they, there was a copy of One Potato that sold for $400. And that's the most money that any of our records ever made, I think, probably. <laughs> so Major would have turned over you, in his grave. He would have turned over in his grave. I made $100 off Night of the Phantom, which I had to give 50 to Slater. That's well, it. <laughs> that's it. I didn't make a nickel off of either of the, any of the songs that I wrote. Um, I, the, but we, we know that Major Bill did. If you own publishing, you got it. And he owned it. We didn't have it. We didn't have any. I mean, we get artist rights. What, a penny or something? Yeah every time and he I checked with BMI one time to find out what we were getting and it it wasn't that much it really wasn't somebody looked into it for us and found out that he had sold the record to Parlophone which was a big English uh, pr production or distribution company over there and they were playing it on Radio Luxembourg which was the blowtorch in in, mid in the middle of Europe it had like 90,000 watts or something and uh, so here our song was playing over there. So we go to Major Bell and we say, well, are we going to make anything off of this? And he said, do you know how much it costs to produce this stuff? Do you know how much it costs to market this stuff? Do you know how much it costs to, to just get you guys in the studio? And he started giving us all these reasons why any money that we would be having, <laughs> that we would be getting, was already spent or used up. So uh, we never saw a, a red cent on anything that we ever did. It was definitely a much more fluid time because everybody was just starting out guessing at things in the 60s. You know, nobody, nobody had a plan and nobody had any expectations. It wasn't like, you know, we got to get our lawyer together because we might get screwed out of our 3%. I mean, everybody just got, just happily got screwed out of their 3% and then, you know, they spent the rest of their lives complaining about it. Maybe people are interested in those bands because they were really playing. You know, uh, I mean, I've done my share of overdubbing when I first started recording and then realized I was really headed in the wrong direction. but. I think there's, guys it's going to sound so corny, but I think there's something honest about it. I, I think you listen to a record from then and realize, especially if it's a really good record, really good record, that they were actually doing that. They were in a room together doing that. And you listen to a record now that took them two years, $100,000 to make. There's a difference. New bands are trying to ape again, trying to go back to, to playing live in the studio with uh, minimal overdubs, if any. Um, I think like they, they did so well in the 60s, I think some people are trying to like recreate that because it does work, work so well. So I think it's gone first full circle for a lot of people. The idea of garage rock sort of is both literal and figurative because literally it was a place that people learned to play and that allowed them to learn to play without having to find uh, an industry to support them. You know, uh, they didn't have to go to a club that didn't want to hear their, their bad music. Um, they could just play in the garage. Um, and secondly, it created an environment uh, that allowed them to just do whatever they wanted because there was nobody watching, you know. And so I think, I think the cultural impact is sort of multi-leveled, you know, in that, in that it, it, it 
it was the essential notion of do-it-yourself rock and roll. The degree of uh, interest um, still kind of uh, takes me aback, but I'm, I'm happy that people still appreciate what we did you know, and what we accomplished. The lead and the blue notes and everybody else that recorded any songs back then because it was, gosh, we were just kids. They may not remember me for anything else, uh, except that I played in some teen band called Larry and the Blue Notes that had a record out called Night of the Phantom. You know what? That's plenty. It's really great that it is coming back. And maybe some of our great musicians will be known then. You know, somebody will see them and say, oh, yeah, this is great. Bring him in. Bring him in, you know. Let him be a star now, you know. He's 65 years old, but let him be a star. Wow. I wonder, this place is still here. I wonder how it would sound in here. When was the last time you played in here? Uh, probably in 69 or 68. Really? Yeah. Oh, it, it, it always was echoing. Luxuries have gone to your head. I'll do it again in a second because I love where I am. I don't know how that road thing works. If I would have to go through all of it to get to where I am right now, yeah, I'd do it. I would do it again and I have absolutely no regrets. You know, it has been a trip. It has been a journey that I, I don't think I'd ever want to miss. I'd do it again. Yeah. Heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, I'd do it all over yeah. again. We'd do it again? Boy, I sure would. In we would heartbeat. do it all over again in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Definitely. Do it better, though. Yeah. We are doing it again. Uh, of course I do it again. I'm still doing it, by God. <laughs> I do it again. Tomorrow! <laughs> it's a cotton pick and smash. <laughs> <laughs> Up 
potato, sweet potato, four, five potato, six potato, seven potato, more, papa, um, mama, mama, papa, um, mama, papa, um, mama, mama, papa, um, mama, really uh, the teen dream is, you know, to kind of have your moment and then have it remembered. And I feel a lot of compassion and empathy for these musicians when I see them because for me they're always great.